Hello and welcome to the Auto Ag Show. Now sit tight and don't go anywhere because on the show today we've got the biggest SUVs in the country facing off against one another. We also check out Yamaha's brand new motorcycle and we celebrate 10 years of Volkswagen Motorsport with some really exciting race machines. But first, the mighty Toyota Fortuner takes on the updated Ford Endeavor brand new Mahindra Altiurus and Isuzu MUX. It's a clash of the titans as we have four full-sized SUVs. We have the 2019 updated Ford Endeavour, the segment leader Toyota Fortuner, the Isuzu MUX which received an update five months ago and the new kid on the block, the Mahindra Altourist G4. There are a couple of things that these four SUVs have in common. First and foremost, they all are based on the ladder frame chassis. That means they are rigid and can take punishment when they venture out off-roading. Even though the Ford Endeavour offers plenty of off-road modes, the other three are equipped with low-range gearbox. Now, all the four are priced in the range of 30 to 35 lakhs. So the question arises, is the Fortuner the automatic choice or does the Endeavour offer a balance option? Keep in mind, Isuzu builds bulletproof diesel engines. Therefore, is the MUX the way to go? Or are you ready to pay 30 lakhs for a Mahindra? Now we will test these SUVs at this off-road track. Now we'd like to mention one thing, that the Fortuna media car was not available for this shoot. Therefore, we have a privately owned SUV with us. Now we will not shoot this car at the track, but as we have tested the Fortuna before at this track, we will show you how it actually behaves. After driving the Altouris, I was really impressed by the 2.2 litre engine which is really refined and on top of that provides a linear pickup. You just don't feel the turbo lag. But what was slightly disappointing was the harsh ride quality. The stiff suspension would be very uncomfortable for the passengers inside. Even though visually the Endeavour has an imposing road presence, it's the Altouris which is the longest, the widest and the tallest SUV in this lineup. But having said that, the Altouris has a very unique problem. It has a high floor and a low roof, which means that the six foot occupants run short of headroom, especially at the back. But what makes the Altouris stand out is its upmarket cabin with quilted leather upholstery and good build quality and fit finish. Now the Altouris may not be as well equipped as the Endeavour, but it does bring in some segment firsts such as its 360 degree parking camera, electrically adjustable driver's seat with three memory settings and nine airbags. We also liked the steering wheel as it provided plenty of feedback, but the overall driving experience was a bit of a letdown due to harsh ride quality. The ladder frame chassis gives the Altouris good off-road credibility. It feels fairly confident off the road despite not having locking diffs. Now coming to the third row, it offers plenty of width, but the seed squap lacks under thigh support as they are very low. Also, as the Altouris has a thick C pillar, it can get quite claustrophobic for the passengers. Now the Isuzu is the oldest among the four SUVs that we have today, but the 3 litre engine is a gem and it is mated with a 5 speed torque converter. I know it doesn't sound as sophisticated as the other SUVs, but what it actually does is reduces the turbo lag. Therefore, it is a very good vehicle both for the city as well as on the highway. The MUX's cabin design is simple and minimalistic. Isuzu has tried to spruce up the cabin with the use of soft leather, but again, limited in the frills department. But one can't find any flaws when it comes to solid built interiors that will last. The eyesore has to be the outdated infotainment system. The Isuzu continues to impress on the road as it has the best ride quality among all the SUVs here. 
Its suspension setup, meanwhile, ensures that the least amount of suspension movement is transferred to the body and it easily dismisses potholes. The MUX scores well on the off-road front too as its otherwise light steering wheel becomes quite laden with feel the moment you engage four-wheel drive. Isuzu's powertrain magic becomes apparent once again here as any throttle pedal input results in very accurate wheel movements giving you fantastic confidence while tackling off-road obstacles. Another thing that surprised us was that the MUX has the second most spacious middle row thanks to the accommodating wide shoulder room. It offers plenty of knee room and gets comfortable and supportive seats. Also when it comes to headroom, there's plenty of it. The third row on the other hand gets armrests and the seats offer good under thigh support. But as the second row seats don't slide, this eats into the third row's legroom. Toyota has gone the comfort way with the Fortuner. Now the upholstery is all leather and the seats are also comfortable. But if you take a closer look at the plastics, they are hard and do come out a little bit cheap. Also the infotainment system gets an 8 inch screen which is quite intuitive but sadly it does not come with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. The Fortuner remains the benchmark when it comes to durability and reliability. At the same time it also ensures unbelievable low running costs and mouth-watering resale prices. Furthermore, the Fortuner is offered with the widest range of powertrain options which makes it even more appealing. The unit we tested was the diesel manual with a 2.8 litre 174 bhp engine that is the freest revving unit on the list, although some of that is down to the 6-speed manual gearbox. When you put the engine in power mode, the Fortuner feels quite powerful and the way it gains speed is quite alarming considering the sheer size of the thing. The light clutch pedal and the short throw gearbox make this version of the Fortuner quite engaging to drive. This level of driver engagement makes the off-road experience in the Fortuner by far the most involving as you have total control over power modulation and get a greater sense of traction and overall control while off-roading. On the flip side, the Fortuner has the bumpiest ride among all of the SUVs here and it falls short of the Endeavour and the Alturas in terms of equipment. Despite the fact that there's a lot of leather in the cabin, the plastics and the switchgear feel tacky. But you still know it's well built and will last forever. Even though the Fortuner has the shortest wheelbase in this SUV lineup, it offers the most spacious third row. Now the secret behind this is that it gets reclining seats, but as the roof line is low, the third row feels cramped and seats aren't the best as they are flat and don't offer any under thigh support. Also with dark interiors, the cabin as a whole feels a lot more smaller and tighter than it actually is. The Ford Endeavour continues to have a very rich interiors and on top of that, it is the only SUV which comes with a huge panoramic view. The Endeavour provides decent space at the third row, but unfortunately, getting in and out is a big problem because the second row only slides and doesn't fold. The facelift Endeavour now gets a new front grille, a new set of alloys and keyless entry with an engine start-stop button. This means that the Endeavour remains up to date in terms of features and is the best equipped vehicle in its class. But what makes the Endeavour stand out is its integrated active noise cancellation feature that makes the cabin silent. The Endeavour feels very refined under normal driving conditions and the suspension on this updated model seems to be slightly more comfortable than the previous one. Meanwhile, it's the 3.2-litre, five-cylinder turbo diesel engine that continues to offer excellent drivability. Talking of off-road credentials, well, this is the only SUV that comes with locking rear differential and is also equipped with terrain management system that electronically varies throttle inputs to the wheels for better traction. Believe it or not, the Endeavour's second row feels slightly cramped as the shoulder room is limited 
when compared to the MUX. As mentioned earlier, the Endeavour comes with a huge panoramic roof, which unfortunately eats into the second row's headroom. All in all, there's plenty of room in the cabin and the seats are quite comfortable. The quality levels also feel good and the cabin as a whole is well designed and feels premium. Coming to safety, the Endeavour now comes with 6 airbags as a standard feature, while the Titanium Plus versions get 7 airbags, along with a host of other features such as hands-free tailgate operation. So after testing these 4 SUVs at this off-road track, we finally found the answers to what we are looking at. Now let's start with the MUX first. Now it is all about being simplistic and utilitarian. That doesn't mean that it doesn't have the power. The 3 litre engine which is mated with a 5 speed torque converter ensures that there is enough power and it negates the turbo lag as well. Another thing that goes in the MUX's favour is the ride quality. It is among the best out of the four. It is slightly on the softer side but when it comes to taking on potholes in the road, it easily cushions them without any problems at all. The passengers inside the cabin have a very comfortable ride. The MUX also offers substantial space in the third row and two adults can comfortably sit. Toyota has gone the bling way as the Fortuner now comes with slim LED projector headlamps and a huge chrome nose. The Fortuner's 2.8 litre engine offers plenty of low end torque which ensures that it is easy to drive in the city. The Alturus is a surprise package as the 2.2 litre engine is extremely refined and it also offers a linear pickup and negates any sort of turbo lag. The cabin on the other hand is class leading thanks to its quilted leather seats which is extremely comfortable and supportive. Now coming to the ride, unfortunately it is quite stiff and every time you go over a pothole you can feel the thud. Therefore, the ride quality is slightly uncomfortable. So the winner of our comparison is the Ford Endeavour which is the most balanced SUV in this lineup. Now not only does it offer a commanding road presence but also has a very comfortable cabin. On top of that it offers noise cancellation for the cabin that ensures that outside noise cannot penetrate. It also has the most powerful engine the 3.2 litre which offers a lot of grunt but it also suffers from some initial turbo lag. All in all the Ford Endeavour is both confident off and on the road. Now don't go anywhere, because when we come back, Shivang checks out Yamaha's latest motorcycle in India, the MT-15. <laughs> Welcome back to the AutoX show. Now Shivang finally gets his hands on Yamaha's brand new 150cc street naked, the MT-15. You know when you're a kid, a sport bike is perhaps the ultimate expression of motorcycling. The lure of owning a full-fared motorcycle is unmatched. And that's why perhaps most of us end up buying these bikes. Take the Yamaha R15 for instance. It's now in its third generation and it's doing massive sales numbers. And that's because it's a full-fared sports bike. Now the latest model, the R15 version 3, is simply spectacular. The engine is phenomenal, the handling is next level and it's a proper track-focused bike. However, having said that, you can't really ride it on a daily basis. You see, because it's simply too aggressive, the riding posture is very focused. So imagine if you take all the impractical bits out of the R15 without taking out any of the fun factor. Well, if you do that, this is what happens. The MT15, a naked, more street focused version of the Yamaha R15 version 3. And as you can see, we are at the Buddha International Circuit to test this bike. Of course, it's not meant for air, but it'll give us a fair idea of how it'll behave on the road. Now, the MT-15 is Yamaha's first mainstream MT series bike in India. And as you can see, it retains the signature design of its bigger siblings. I especially like the alienish face of this bike. You see those twin pods and a projector headlamp. It really looks very nice. And I think for this reason alone, it'll find a lot of takers. Now apart from this, this motorcycle shares all of its cycle parts with the Yamaha R15 version 3. The single cylinder 155cc engine is the same as the R15's unit and it springs to life with the same thrum. However, thanks to a retuned ECU and revised final drive ratio, the MT15 pulls harder in lower gears. The motor is smooth and revs freely and you may even find yourself hitting the rev limiter very easily. 
There are perceptible vibrations after you cross 7000 RPM as the handlebar gets quite buzzy. Overall though, the engine has a lot of character and its performance as expected is very strong. Due to its bigger rear sprocket and lack of any kind of wind cutting mechanism, the top speed of the MT15 will also take a hit. However, you'll be able to see 125 to 130 kmph on the speedo without any real trouble. The gearbox is a 6-speeder and gets a slipper and assist clutch just like the R15. Shifts are precise and working the transmission is a delicately smooth affair. Now the MT15 shares the same underpinnings as the R15 V3, meaning it features a delta box frame and an identical suspension setup. This also means it gets a conventional front fork instead of an upside down fork which is offered on the international spec model. However, compared to the R15 its wheelbase is 10mm longer. The trail however is identical at 88mm. Also it gets a box type steel swing arm and not a cast aluminium unit found in the R15. This is of course done to keep the cost in check. But despite all of this, the MT15 is 4 kilos lighter than the R15. And at the racetrack, it was quite evident that the MT15 has a sharper and quicker steering courtesy of its light front end. However, in terms of feedback, it definitely isn't as communicative as the R15. But the inherent goodness of the R15 chassis is visible when you go hunting for corners. The MT15 remains supremely stable around turns, while the MRF tires grip well too. But there are some flaws which are quite evident. For example, under hard braking and before corner entry, the rear does tend to get out of shape at times. And sudden direction changes can be unsettling because of the bike's super quick steering and restrictive saddle space. Now feature-wise again, it's uh, more or less the same as the R15, you get LED headlamps. Apart from that, there's a similar uh, digital instrument cluster uh, with all the telltale lights. As for its brakes, it gets disc brakes on both ends and their performance is satisfactory. However, the front does lack bite, and that's one area where it needs improvement. Also, surprisingly, the MT15 gets single-channel ABS as opposed to RM5's dual-channel system. So we are done riding the MT15, and it's verdict time now. So what do I think about this motorcycle? Well, like I said in the beginning, it's truly an R15 without fairing. It's meant for road, it's more comfortable, it has the same sort of performance and on the road, I'm sure it'll be more fun because it's compact, it's agile and I think Yamaha has got it spot on apart from perhaps one thing, that's the price. You know, this bike has a sticker price of 1,36,000 X showroom and that's only 3,000 rupees less than the R15. Again, it's a great package but it would have been a great value if it were priced around 1.2 to 1.25 lakh. Otherwise, I think it's a great bike. Now don't go anywhere, because when we come back, Abhishek heads to a racetrack to check out a very special bunch of VW race cars. Welcome back to the Auto X Show. Now it's no secret that VW Motorsport produces some of the best race machines in the country. Here's a look at 10 years worth of exquisite race machines, plus the maddest track day Frankenstein VW Polo that you can imagine. Welcome to an adrenaline packed morning here at the Madras Motorsport Racetrack in Chennai. We are here today to drive a range of Volkswagen Motorsport cars starting off from the Polo Cup car to today's INRC spec rally cars from Volkswagen Motorsport. The first Cup cars were powered by a 1.6 litre common rail turbo diesel engine that was good for 130 bhp. This car though was not too far away from the road going model in terms of its powertrain and was viewed to provide an easy entry for novice racing drivers. Then in 2012, VW swapped the 1.6 Polo R with the new Polo R Cup car, which had an engine from the then Polo GTI, a 1.4 liter supercharged and turbocharged petrol engine that was putting down 180 horsepower. In 2015, the Vento Cup One Make Racing Championship replaced the Polo Cup. These Ventos were running the same hardware as the 2012 Polo R with a 30 kg weight increase owing to the larger body shell. And today, VW Motorsport India is running the Amio Cup Championship. 
The Amio Cup car is powered by a 1.8 litre turbo petrol engine that has 202 bhp. The most recent initiative from VW Motorsport came in last year in 2018 when it ran three ITC spec Vento race cars from the VW factory team. This was done in an attempt to showcase the car to potential clients and generate interest. Now, championship-worthy racing cars are required to meet numerous regulations to ensure they are on par with other cars on the grid. To this extent, the Volkswagen Vento ITC weighs in under 1100 kilos, has a 30mm airflow restrictor to keep power output at check, and an engine that's under the 2-litre mark. Now, since the Vento ITC is operating on a level playing field, Volkswagen says that it shows its magic in the handling department with a superior chassis. Another Vento that VW Motorsport has on offer is called the Vento Tractic. This one is an unrestricted racing car that does not meet any motorsport regulations and is purely designed for personal track days. Prospective clients for this one are track day enthusiasts. Running a supercar on track days in India is unrealistically expensive, so people can instead have one of these hardcore racing cars for running track days with enhanced performance and indeed better lap times. The Vento Track Day can be ordered with a range of engine options to choose from. VW is in fact looking at introducing yet another Track Day car in the form of this rather extreme rear engine, rear wheel drive Polo. The Polo RX does not meet any motorsport regulations right now, but VW is in talks with the FMSCI to see where something like this can fit in. For now though, customers can order this race car with a 2 litre turbo engine with 350 horsepower. Prices for the Polo RX start at Rs 48 lakh and depending on options can go up to as much as Rs 70 lakhs with carbon fiber bodywork. Aside from these track focused cars, VW has also made a huge impact in Indian rally with 60% of rally cars in the INRC today being Polo rally cars. VW currently has three different rally cars for novice to more experienced drivers in the form of the INRC 2 Polo, the INRC 1 Polo and then the Polo R2. With its ITC, INRC and Cup Car initiatives, Volkswagen is slowly beginning to ingrain itself in the domestic motorsport scenario. Considering their superior machinery and focus on providing timely service and spares to owners during races, things sure are looking very promising for Volkswagen Motorsport India. As for us, we can't wait to actually drive the rear-engine rear-wheel drive Polo to truly experience the race-focused nature of this car. And if the FMSCI does make room for such a race car, it truly is going to open up a whole new dimension in the motorsport arena here. Well, that's all the time we have for you today. Thank you for joining us. Follow us on social media for your daily dose of all things automotive. And remember, it's chaos out there. So always buckle up and wear your helmets. We'll see you again next weekend on the AutoX Show.